Hey now, and welcome to Quantum Drive. I'm Rob. I'm Katie. And our ongoing mission is to discuss every episode of The Orville. Today we are discussing Season 2, Episode 8, entitled Identity Part 1, which is written by Brandon Braga and Andre Romanis and directed by John Kassar. We do have a new review this week. Ooh. This one comes in from Yeti at Large, who starts off by saying, Best podcast ever. The review says, Funny thing happened. I was listening to an Orville podcast, and it was somewhat okay. It was long and off topic a lot. They have a segment where they talk about competing podcasts. So one day they mentioned this podcast called Quantum Drive. Ever since, Quantum Drive is the only Orville podcast on my list now. Thanks to a bad Orville podcast, I now enjoy the best Orville podcast. Oh my goodness. That is an interesting way for a listener to find us. I have not heard that. I didn't even know there's a podcast that does a segment where they talk about competing ones. No. In our opinion, there's really no competition in the sense that the more podcasts that are out there talking about the Orville, the better. Mm -hmm. But hey, if someone wants to mention our show on another one and bring over new listeners, we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I just I love this show. Rob loves this show. So we are always like the more the merrier. So I'm just well, thanks for listening and liking our show. That means a lot. Yeah, greatly appreciated. If you would like to email us, you can do so by sending an email to quantum drive at the dot com. You can follow us on Twitter at quantum drive pod. You can join our discord at the geek generation dot com slash discord to chat with us about the show. If you'd like access to Mark's alternate one sentence reviews, you can support the show on Patreon at thegeekgeneration.com slash support. Before we talk about the episode, Katie's got trivia. I do. So first things first, I guess last also, there's a farewell speech by Isaac in this episode. And I recognized the speech. I don't know if you did. I did. I didn't recognize the source because I just didn't remember, but I definitely recognize the format of it. It's copied from Sally Field's acceptance speech from the 1985 Oscars, but there are some minor changes to it. Mm. So you can look up the, the two different. It seems like Isaac put his own twist on it. Makes sense. There is a moment, too, where Scott Grimes, who plays Gordon, sings to Isaac. Mm -hmm. And he actually did his own singing for this, which he sounded really good. He did. And he performed the song Goodbye by Air Supply. We've seen him do this, like recreate the scene at several Comic-Con panels, and it's wonderful to watch every time. Mm -hmm. He's got a great voice. He really does. At the end of the episode, Isaac's Race, the Kalon, we find out they're created by humans, and the Kalon wiped them out. It's similar to an episode from Star Trek Voyager entitled Prototype from 1996. Oh, I may have seen it. I definitely don't remember it. I'm still working through Voyager, so may I'll get there. I'll keep that one in mind. <laughs> There's that really cool game they play at the beginning of this episode. I think it's called Bolodon Discs. Yeah, that sounds right. And apparently it's a nod to 3D chess from the Star Trek franchise. And I could totally see that. And this was an interesting thing. There are no formal rules for the game, but there is a general sense of how the crew wanted the game to look. And so John Kassar said, quote, I'm sure some fan could do that for us, unquote, kind of come up with some rules. Because I was like, how do you make sense if they're just spinning things and hitting mm -hmm. buttons? It looked fun, though, and I would be down to play that without any rules, just because it'd be fun to press buttons and line things up. My first thought was definitely that looks like 3D chess in a way. So I, I understand that nod for sure. The actor who plays Ty Finn, Kai Wenner, actually drew that picture that he gave Isaac. I love that. It was so good, too. It was a really good picture. It was. And it makes sense because if you're going to have someone else do that, yeah, you could kind of make it look like a kid's drawing, but you're never going to get that level of authenticity that a kid would bring to it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was. A, I mean, that was such a cute moment. And I know we'll get into that when we talk about the episode, too. Mm -hmm. Mark Jackson, who plays Isaac, actually had to teach several classes to the 30 actors portraying Kalons on how to walk and speak like Isaac. That's pretty darn cool to be like, all right, this is how I play Isaac, and this is how the race needs to also. He demonstrated that a little bit at a con as well. Like, he was mm -hmm. up on stage and showing, like, why he does what he does with his hands. Apparently, that's a thing kind of mimicking Roger from American Dad, the alien. Oh. He does that with his hands as well. So Mark saw that and was like, oh, I'm going to do that, too. 
Yeah. I can now, now I can never unsee that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love American Dad. One of the most difficult aspects of filming this episode was when the Kalons turn at the wall and look at them and synchronizing them. So John Kassar said, that was a big challenge. We shot that many, many, many times to make sure they were completely in sync. There was no room for error. That makes sense. I mean, I was also thinking that as I was watching this. I was like, they had to all be just right to turn and look. If they're going to be robots, it has to be perfect. That hive mind. This is just a fun fact about the grave tunnel. I like how it's called a grave tunnel also. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same set used as the cave in Nothing Left on Earth Excepting Fishes, that episode. Nice. Yeah, we've seen the reuse of sets before. Good uh, efficiency. Mm -hmm. Budget saving techniques. I like it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, this is interesting. So in, in the episode Priya, Isaac lied. When he said his eye lights are just merely aesthetic, but in fact, they are barrels of his gun turrets. Yeah. And if you think back to like all the episodes we've watched, that is so unsettling. Yeah. Every I since we know this now, mm -hmm. like every time you see Isaac in any past episodes, you're like, those are guns. Yeah. So it's um, it's interesting now that we know there's a lot to talk about with this episode. Oh, yeah. That's all the fun facts for this episode. There are no guest special guest stars this time around. All right. Isaac, Marcus, and Ty are in the Finns' quarters playing a game of bullet on discs. When Isaac wins, Ty complains that he always does. Isaac has no sympathy for the boy and tells him that it's to be expected because he's much more intelligent. Marcus tells Isaac that comments like that make people feel bad, but Isaac insists he's just stating facts. I mean, it does make people feel bad when you're like, I'm a lot more intelligent than you. And it is like he has said that a lot. Isaac, that's one of his like slogans yeah. <laughs> at this point. But it makes sense. He's a robot. The kids just were playing a game and he wants to win. And you can't really win against a robot. No. I guess there's computer chess. Sometimes you can win against the robot and computer chess. You can, but it's not like these kids are like genius prodigies that are going to defeat a Kalon level intellect or anything. He's playing against kids. An adult mm -hmm. would possibly beat them. So <laughs> a super advanced artificial intelligence wipes the floor with them. I do like the game, though. That looks like a fun game to play. It does look fun. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think the point of this scene, too, at least for me, it felt like it was to show how little Isaac has grown yeah. over the course of his time on aboard the Orville. Like he's there to observe and collect data, but he doesn't seem to be learning a lot from it. No, he's gathering data and he's adapting to specific uncomfortable scenarios, per se, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. But he's not really evolving. He doesn't have that need or want to become human that data did. Like yeah. Data was always trying to become more human. So his behavior grew as he collected data. And we saw that reflected in his behavior. Isaac does not have that desire whatsoever. So he's perfectly fine being just cold and rude. He does little things here and there for the sake of others. But I wouldn't even say it's for the sake of others. It's part of his study. Yeah. He's very arrogant mm -hmm. for a robot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claire arrives home, and she and Isaac sit the boys down to tell them that the two of them are seeing one another. Ty is thrilled, and Marcus isn't at all surprised, insisting that everyone's already figured it out. As Claire is thanking the boys for being happy for her, Isaac suddenly deactivates and falls to the floor. This whole episode was a roller coaster of emotions for me. Mm -hmm. He hits the ground hard, and I was like, first of all, they're announcing their relationship and the kids are just like cool as a cucumber about it. It's like, this is adorable. And then Isaac just essentially, he just shuts down. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine if you are in a relationship with a robot, it's like probably the equivalent of someone you love having a heart attack. Very much so. Yeah, I would think so as well. It's a great cold open for the episode as well. Mm -hmm. We get a little character moment right at the beginning and then boom, major issue right away. Yeah. And then just slides right into that nice smooth orville opening where you're like wait but i wait wait <laughs> yeah you're invested you're invested you're on board yeah. for this roller coaster immediately mm -hmm. in sick bay mercer and lamar join dr finn as she examines isaac she's unable to determine anything that could be considered a sign of life 
Grayson reports that ship diagnostics haven't detected anything abnormal either, nor is there anything unusual in their current region of space. Claire denies John's request to examine him in engineering, so without any other options, Ed asks Tala to get in touch with Admiral Halsey. I think John requesting just kind of crack him open like a piece of machinery and be like, let's see if I can put two wires together and turn them back on is... I guess it's he's trying to help, but it's just such an unfounded way to maybe handle the situation. But I know maybe they're desperate at that point. And I think the way that he said it is not what his real intention was. No, I think he was more thinking, let me bring him down to engineering, because that seems like the environment where we could actually get more useful data on him. Like this is a this is a sick bay. This is for biological creatures. You don't have the equipment here that I do, Mm -hmm. but I think the way he said it was just so like rude and didn't work for someone who's obviously in an emotional place like Claire is. So I think if he had phrased it differently, Claire might have been okay, but she definitely is affected by her emotional attachment to Isaac here to be like, oh, no, he's my patient. Yeah, I do think she's handling it better than I expected her to, Mm -hmm. considering that he's just essentially kind of dead on the table more or less but i think in some ways there's the hope of well he's a robot not a normal person kind of situation so there's hope there but i can imagine just her because she's she's had this relationship with him she's put herself in this extra emotional state like you're not just a doctor patient at that point Mm -hmm. and so i think that it's it's nice to see her keep her cool even though it's she's so close to the situation Mercer has proposed to Halsey that they take Isaac back to Kalon to find out what's wrong. The Admiral says that it's a tricky thing to attempt, but also an opportunity to speak to them about joining the Union, so he gives them permission to try. The Orville sets a course for Kalon and engages Quantum Drive. I always get excited when they say engage Quantum Drive because I'm like, the podcast, the podcast. (laughs) I weirdly do too. (laughs) Yeah, so it was interesting with Bordis kind of going, wait, did you say Kalon? I mean, I'm excited for this episode at this point because I'm like, oh, man, we're going to go see where where Isaac comes from. And I'm also sad because I'm like, Isaac also might be dead. But I'm (laughs) but um, I did enjoy the conversation with Admiral Halsey with the picture your mom trying to set up a stereo. And he's just like, oh, yeah, like it was just like everyone can relate to somebody they know in their life who has trouble with technology. They're just out of their depth. Mm hmm. Meanwhile, Ty is talking to Isaac in sickbay, despite Marcus telling him there's no reason to. Even so, Marcus still says goodnight to him as he leaves. Emotionally distraught, Claire tells the android that she loves him and asks him not to go. It was really sad with Ty just being like, when you come back, you can be my my dad or our dad. And I mean, such little kid wonderment Mm -hmm. and hope and Marcus being much more realistic about it. But he did say goodnight to Isaac before he left. He did. And it is sad because this is like the first time Claire says I love you to him. I think that we've heard at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes you root for them a little bit. Sure. And um, hope there's a solution because I really like Isaac. I want him to be back on the ship alive dating Claire. <laughs> As the Orville approaches Kalon, they hail the planet but suddenly lose main power. A beam then ominously scans the ship. Following the scan... Power is restored, and the Orville receives a set of landing coordinates. All very, like, medical, this part. Like, very sterile. The scan was interesting, because you Mm. could see it. Because at that point, they don't say anything. It's just, like, the ship lights dim, and Mm. then the scan goes through. And then they all they get is, like, uh, docking coordinates, or landing coordinates. And, I mean, it makes sense, though. I was like, well, this fits for this race, or this robotic culture. Like they don't communicate by way of verbal. They just kind of like, yeah, we're scanning you now. Yeah. But they're allowing them on the planet surface. Well, I, they would have seen Isaac's body. Mm-hmm. And they got the information from Ed. They know that this is where Isaac was assigned to. So it makes sense, everything they're doing here. I know, but it's it's nerve wracking. It is. And so it, the tension in this episode was really good. It was, yeah. There were a lot of subtle little things that kind of added up to where we ended up by the end of the episode. Yeah. The ship navigates through a Kalon city before docking at the provided location. After receiving further instructions, a team of Mercer, Grayson, Tala, and Dr. Finn take Isaac off the ship and into a massive Kalon structure. Upon entering, they see a wall of Kalon, 
who synchronously look in their direction before turning back to their work. They are then greeted by Kalon Primary, who welcomes them to their world. That whole scene, I was just wondering what they were analyzing on that wall. I was also wondering how they got up there. Also wondering, like, what what the buttons do. And just, yeah, the whole wall was mesmerizing to me. The whole planet is. It's a very sterile environment. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. They don't eat. There's no trash. There's trash, but there's probably, like, from manufacturing, I would assume. Yeah, it's probably minimal, yeah. Yeah, so it's just weird to see such a sterile environment of just robots living together yeah they all have red eyes too red or orange did they have were there orange eyes i think some had orange as well okay because i but which is so starkly different than isaac oh yeah i can see why they would have different lights for isaac kind of knowing how different colors can affect different things Mm -hmm. from a production standpoint it makes sense because we have to identify isaac amongst all the others regardless so true yeah Blue is a much more common color, though, than aggressive red, because yeah. it feels aggressive. And they, the way they interact is kind of aggressive from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Ugh. They have even less tact. Yeah, and it, <laughs> it just made me nervous. From I'm like, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> After the ominous scanning beam that we just saw, too, this wall of Kalon is like creepy foreshadowing part two. <laughs> I know. The thing that is the case, Kalon are kind of creepy in groups. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't like them in groups. Also, as they're flying in through the city, not only did the city look super cool, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't help but pay attention to the way that the light was. So we don't often get to see the ship within a planet's atmosphere being affected by daylight. So the way that it comes in through like the windows of the ship and we could see like the bright lights against like one side of their face and then when the Orville is flying over the city from like the bird's eye view, I couldn't help like looking at the shadows being cast and everything. It's all just super impressive. Mm-hmm. And it looked it looked phenomenal. Like this, I, I guess highways is one of the ways. Yeah, to put it. yeah. that was really interesting because I'm like, what are they doing? Because it's different than just cars on a roadway. Yeah, it was really fascinating seeing Isaac's world. And I think they did a really good job of futuristic space world that Seems uh, like there's nothing too much to be worried about. Seems like a very basic society. Simple enough, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was going to start referring to Kalon Primary as KP, and then I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> that's Katie Peters. You can. <laughs> we can set the precedent right there. <laughs> like, I, In the rest of my summary, I just referred to him as Primary because I thought okay. it was going to save me some time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Primary informs them that Isaac is not damaged. He was deactivated because his research mission is complete. The next step means disassembling him to be reintegrated. The crew makes a plea for Isaac's life, and the Kalon take him away, ordering them to wait where they are. I can't imagine how hard it would be to just watch them push him into a back room. Not knowing if he's coming back. Yeah. The other thing, too, is I'm like, how did they determine his research was done? But they must have known that that would have drawn them to the planet. Oh, yeah. This all, in hindsight, this all looks very calculated. They yeah. needed the Orville at Kalon to pull this off. Ew. I don't like it, Rob. <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to. <laughs> it is sad because I, I I was like, oh, they're just taking him into the back to dissemble him. <laughs> like, he's just never coming back. Right? Like, they didn't give an answer. They were just like, oh, wait here. Yeah, there was no answer. It was just... Okay, I guess he's he's going to have his legs taken off in the bag and his arms and put on another robot. In another room, Isaac is reactivated, where he's informed why he was both deactivated and then reactivated. He returns with Primary to speak with the crew. Mercer asks if they made a decision about joining the Union, but Primary says they're still going over all the data and have some additional questions. When Grayson asks if he's ready to get back to work, Isaac says he won't be returning to the Orville. Claire is furious and hurt as she walks away with the crew. Isaac's pretty cold here, too. He is, yeah. And that's sad from a viewer perspective because we've invested. I've invested in him and been like, oh, it's Isaac. He's kind of quirky, but he's our robot kind of yep. thing. And so it's hard to see him just kind of go, oh, yeah. Like like you said earlier with Data, Data would not have had that kind of reaction. No. It would have been much more like I've enjoyed getting to know you and all of that. Isaac's just kind of like, yeah, I did my thing. Why? Okay. Yeah, we dated. Meh. It's it's hard to see that because it's just he's okay with it. Mm-hmm. And 
he's hurting so many people that we've grown to care about. Yeah. He has no reason not to be okay with it, though, because like I said before, Claire is just projecting everything on Isaac where it seems like he cares. It's really just part of his mission. The whole thing. Everything. Yeah. It's all been a plan. I noticed, too, when they're reactivating him and Isaac's head opens up. If you do like look and really pay attention, because I look very carefully, you can see all the components of the head cannons inside there, like the little spikes oh. that come off the side. It's all in there and folded up. We just mm -hmm. would have no idea what we were looking at until later. Yeah. Like when he was on the planet with the kids, when they use the blaster or he uses the blaster on the planet when he's protecting the kids, he could have just used his head cannon. Mm -hmm. But because he was concealing it. Ah, he's been lying to us the whole time, Rob. He has. <laughs> At Claire's request, Isaac returns to the Orville briefly to say goodbye to Marcus and Ty. Ty is particularly her as he now thinks of Isaac as part of the family. I get it. Yeah. It's hard to not feel for the kids or Claire at this point. He's just so callous about it, and that's what makes it hard. Yeah. Ty just looks at him as a human being. Like, mm -hmm. he's a robot, but to a kid... It's like, yeah, he's just a robot person, like not, yeah. not just like a robot. He's a robot person. Ty is like me with inanimate <laughs> objects. So, Mercer and Grayson meet with Primary to further discuss the potential of the Kalon joining the Union. Primary tells them that from the Kalon point of view, there's not much to be gained from Union membership. Additionally, they're concerned with the humans' destructive history, citing war, greed, and genocide. Ed and Kelly argue that they've evolved, but the Kalon also point out the abuse that Isaac suffered at the hands of their own crew, specifically an incident with Mr. Potato Head pieces. Can we just talk about how hypocritical it is that the primary is saying this stuff? Knowing what we know now, absolutely. He's got some balls <laughs> to say that. And they say like he was abused on mm -hmm. the ship. But I do wonder how Isaac formulated that report. And who, who came to the conclusion that that was considered abuse? Right. And Ed says it, too, like that was a way to try and teach Isaac humor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't intended as bullying or abuse. He was curious about pranks, and therefore they showed him what a prank was. Mm -hmm. But because the Kalon don't understand humor, they look at it as abuse. Also, I think they're slightly manipulative. Oh, for sure. There's just a lot that uh, it's just it's very manipulative that for, when you look at it at the end of the episode to this point, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is calculated. Oh, yeah. I feel like every little bit was mm -hmm. back on the Orville. Tala is escorting Isaac to take care of one more piece of discharge protocol that's off book. She then opens the door to the mess hall, revealing a large portion of the crew that has prepared a surprise farewell party. It seems odd that they're doing this because of how the terms he's leaving on don't seem to warrant a farewell party. Agreed. Although I would argue that this is more for them than it is for Isaac. Yeah. And that makes sense, too. I do feel it's a very nice thing for them to do for such an awful situation yeah. in a lot of ways. Very true. I love Gordon's line here where he says, you should have seen the look on your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is nice because they all have a good humor about it. Mm -hmm. And they're all there considering that he's just kind of like, peace, I'm done. See ya. Speaking of peace, there's also the scene in here with uh, the fan favorite scene where Bordas requests a corner piece of the cake. Look, I feel for Bordas. I get it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I want the corner piece. And that's completely fair to ask for it. Why wouldn't he just put down the piece John handed him and been like, yeah, cut me that corner piece? Is it because he touched it at that point? Maybe. Maybe he felt obligated at that point because it was handed to him. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I don't know, Bordis will, I think at this stage, he's still my favorite. Yeah, he just, he wanted the flower. Let him have that flower, man. <laughs> Bordis likes his frosting. That's what we know. Mm -hmm. Before Isaac can leave, Claire stops him to tell him that even though she's mad at him, she wouldn't want to give up the time that she and the boys spent with him. Ty then gives him a drawing that he made of their family and runs away upset. As Isaac is leaving the ship, he unceremoniously discards the drawing on the floor. I had to headcan in this a little bit. I mm -hmm. was like, maybe he took a picture. Maybe. Of it. Because like they don't have material items really on Kalon. 
though it it's so heartbreaking when he just throws it on the floor. Mm-hmm. It's like a stomach drop kind of moment where you're like, oh, he's not nice. <laughs> like one of those like, oh, he's not. He doesn't have those human qualities that you really think he does. Yeah, he has no sentimentality. Ugh, that just makes me sad. <laughs> Even though it did feel accurate to me that he would like toss it away. I can't imagine Isaac throwing anything on the floor no. like in the middle of a corridor. Like I know I know it had to be somewhere where it could be found for the sake of the plot so that Ty yeah. could find it and be like, oh, Isaac left this behind. But Isaac would throw it in a trash. I agree. So there's just a lot of pieces here that seem like I think Isaac does have some sort of innate humanness do you think tossing it was emotional Ooh, i was thinking that it's more of like a yeah honestly maybe he's more like if i take this with me it'll be constant reminder of this we all know that his his system works better with claire true so in some ways is it like him ripping the band-aid off though it seems unlike him to just litter in the hallway yeah. And not throw it away. At this point, he would understand the trash system on the Orville. <laughs> yeah. This is probably the first instance in him ever being aboard the ship that he didn't throw something away where it needed to go. And f- so for me, the whole maybe he was emotional about it and it was like an act of frustration or sadness or something, even if it's just an inkling that he needed to remove his thought process of it. And it wasn't just a drop. It was a no. push away. Mm-hmm. There's there's something there. There has to be. For my hope to continue on, there has to be. <laughs> the next morning, still docked on Kalon, Bordis reports that a scan has revealed a large amount of spherical objects in the southern hemisphere that are unlike anything else they've seen. Though scans can't penetrate the hull, they do detect a large amount of theta radiation, something commonly associated with particle weapons. They kind of write that off right away, too, as yeah. like planet defense stuff. Which more were popping up, though. Mm-hmm. Just a lot of things that are a little bit off here. Yep, more ominous foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, they're robots. They'll just make stuff. But there wouldn't be a purpose mm-hmm. to just make things. And if it's weaponry, huh, maybe we should take a little extra time right? to discuss this. <laughs> Dr. Finn finds Ty in the environmental simulator, where he's climbed a tree to be by himself. She climbs up to join him, and he shows her the drawing that he'd given Isaac. Claire tries to explain that Isaac doesn't have emotions and acts differently, but Ty doesn't understand and only gets more upset. I mean, I get it. He's going through some things. Yeah. But I was wondering, if he fell out of that tree, he would hurt himself, right? One would think so, yeah. Yeah, unless there's some safeguards in, built into the simulator, but... Maybe. That was the whole time I was like, what if they fall? Like, <laughs> the entire time they were up there. It is it is sad because I think Claire's going through her own things and she's trying to be strong for her kid, mm-hmm. too. He's being kind of harsh to her, but it's something where he doesn't understand. He doesn't have the adult thought process yet to know. Yeah, so he's going to lash out. <sighs> Someone should have walked him to class, though. <laughs> True, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily be like, well, I expect you to go to class at some point. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. fingers crossed. Okay, mom. <laughs> I do like the way Claire handled it. She could have just as easily like turned off the simulation or or even like, and yes, like provide something for him to fall on softly. But Mm -hmm. she played along and she went with kind of like his emotional perspective about things. Yeah, it was it was a sweet moment because she does. She loves her kids. And I think they're they're all hurt. Not just Claire. Agreed. With his picture in hand, Ty leaves the Orville through an airlock to find Isaac on K-Lon. To avoid being spotted by some of the inhabitants, he hides in a disposal chute, but accidentally drops his picture to the bottom. When he climbs down to retrieve it, he hears more sounds coming from above, so walks down the tunnel he's currently in instead. The tunnel opens up to a larger cavern, and Ty gets a scared look on his face. The camera cuts away before revealing what he's seen. Kalon's creepy by it, like, with a child running around the surface, just did you hear the Kalon quote unquote talking to each other? Uh huh. I didn't like it. <laughs> More creepiness. More creepy button. I can't do the sound, but it was not pleasant. And my thought is like, wouldn't they have security on the watching cameras, something analyzing if anyone left the ship and watching what they were doing? Maybe, but these are also presumably the first 
people that have been let on to Kalon at all. Like they've never That's had true. a need for that before. That is a, a good point is that it could very much be that they just don't have that in place because they don't realize they need it. But if they had humans on their planet before and know how awful they can be, you would think that they might have some sort of like, we got to watch these fools. <laughs> Maybe. I'm a little more concerned with Ty's ability to get off the ship that easily. Oh, yeah, that was something, too, where he just, like, maybe um, a head cannon. He had his mom's codes. Possibly. But still, I would think for a miner aboard uh, a spaceship, there would be some sort of, like, computer notification instantly as soon as he was trying to get out. Like, the ship would know that it's him and not his mom. I would think. I don't know. I also thought, wow, that was pretty darn easy for a small child to just kind of get off the ship. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some new security protocol needs to be put in place, but I, that's why I was like, oh, maybe it's because he has his mom's access codes. Mm. Also, yeah, it, it makes sense how lifeless their planet looks when you're at this, like, street level. Mm -hmm. We only see the two Kalon walking around, and even from, like, the slightly further away view, there's almost no activity. No. There is art, though, which is interesting. True. I wonder if it has a purpose, though. It might. There's mirrors on it. There's Maybe there's something to it. Yeah. <laughs> From his office, Mercer speaks with Primary, who's still not ready to give him a decision. He's starting to think that something's not right, almost like they're stalling. Just then, Claire rushes in to tell them that Ty's no longer on the ship. Bordas scans the planet and locates him in the subterranean structure. Claire, Bordas, and Tala then head into the tunnels, where they find Ty, who tells them that there's something bad down there. As they reach the end of the tunnel, they find a large pile of bones. Bordas then contacts the bridge and transmits a visual of what they're seeing. The skeletal remains of hundreds of thousands of bodies. Man, that whole thing was like a horror movie setup. Oh, yeah. It was creepy. And then at the end, you're like, oh, it's a pile of bones. Ooh. But then it's like, oh, it's a entire cavern mm -hmm. of bones, which like in the music, too, in this episode was really well done. Oh, yeah. Especially with the reveal of Bone City. It's almost like there's a metaphor for the entire episode that not as everything is as it seems on the surface. Mm. So that, to me, was interesting. And also, what the heck? That's a... What? Like, as a... This whole episode's been a mind destroyer yeah. in a lot of ways. So I... I'm like, what? Are they, wait, what? Now, I, and it, it makes you question everything with Isaac and who he is. And what he's okay with. Oh, yeah. Because we don't know how much at this point, we don't know how much he knows about all of this or even what all of this even is. Yeah. It's just, it's a rough episode of just realizations. Mm -hmm. I uh, I had pointed out in the past that anytime Claire left the ship, she always left her doctor's coat there and put on a like proper union uniform. Mm -hmm. This is the first time we've seen her leave the ship in her doctor's coat. Interesting. It's because there's a rush maybe and she needs to find her kid. That was my thought. Absolutely. She's in a hurry to go see Ty. If she had changed, that would have drawn my attention even more. Yeah. Once again, like the attention to detail. Yeah. It's just so good. Smart choice. Mm -hmm. The away team once again meets with the Kalon, but this time to discuss what they found below the surface. Scans have confirmed that there are thousands of grave sites, indicating that billions have died. Isaac informs them that the bodies belong to the previous inhabitants of their planet, the ones who created them. An unresolvable conflict forced them to eradicate the biological inhabitants because they couldn't coexist. He also reveals that the Kalon never intended to join the Union. As the crew attempts to leave, they're stopped by several Kalon, whose heads open up, revealing two gun turrets. This is when you realize that Isaac also has these. Mm -hmm. Or you assume that he does. Ugh. It's unfortunate that the Kalon are so bad and they really don't care about anything but themselves. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's a robotic function. Their survival is based on logic and they viewed biologicals as holding them back mm -hmm. and they must be eradicated, which is genocide, right? Yeah. And so they're just as bad as what they were saying the humans were or uh, biological. So it's like I said, it's a roller coaster. It is related to what Kelly said earlier, too. Like their thought process is very much binary. Mm -hmm. Everything is a simple choice. There's no gray area. 
It's not like, hey, we're going to let them all live and we'll figure out a way to coexist because maybe they have some potential where they could eventually help us out. It's nope, they're going to stunt our growth, kill them all. Ugh, which is just an awful, there's no reasoning with them because they've made up their minds. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I don't really see a way out of it. (laughs) It's just plain and simple. It's like, oh, they already are overpowered because they have weapons built into their bodies. Yeah. And they're on the Kalon home turf. Yep. Like one union ship is not going to stand a chance against a planet. Oh my gosh. As the Kalon escort the crew, Claire wants answers. Isaac tells her that his mission was to study biologicals, but not to initiate relations between their people. Instead, it was to determine whether or not they were worth preserving. Their determination is that eventually the biologicals would constrain their evolution. The Kalon are ready to start expanding, and coexistence is impossible. Uh. If coexistence is impossible, I wonder if resistance is also futile. The ver- yeah, it's very... But they're not assimilating anybody. They're, they're just flat out killing. Oh, yeah. So you'd think, though, maybe they could see some benefit from making like the biologicals their slaves. Maybe. It's more man hours, but I guess they would always have not fear because they don't feel fear but they would all they would be leaving a variable unchecked yeah i think that all in all it's just a it's a sad realization when isaac also doesn't step in and go whoa like he's just kind of like yep this is what we're doing now and the fact that he admits this was the plan all along i know and it's weird when they ask direct questions meaning the crew from the orvo Mm -hmm. and they go quiet or they don't answer And it's usually Isaac, which kind of lends itself to your theory, though. He knows the answer and he could just say it, but he doesn't want to. Yeah. And want is an emotional response. There's just some there's little trickles of things throughout this episode. where You're like, I mean, Isaac seems to be going along with it, but maybe there's something in the back of his head. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Hopefully. Of his little robotic head. Mercer messages Bordis and orders him to get the Orville out of there, but main power and engines are shut down by a dampening field. Suddenly, every hatch and airlock opens up, allowing the Kalon to board. Security resists with blaster fire, but they're no match for the invaders. You couldn't be. You're just overpowered by the numbers, first of all. Home team advantage. (laughs) And also, the amount of people that I'm assuming died for this. Yeah. Also, where did everybody get these, like, assault rifles? I think think they're in opening things on the wall like opening okay. panels and they're just like stacked up in there it's just interesting that all of a sudden everybody seemed to have like an ar on them but they didn't really seem to matter though yeah which is oof. and it's only a crew of 300 so if I all know. those security i wonder how much security is actually left it was interesting though that they they started rounding people up for us. It's just wiping them out. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. And that if anybody shot at them, they would shoot back. But if someone just peacefully went with them, they wouldn't do it. I wonder if it's because of they're using the Orville to kind of lead the fleet. And if they bump into anybody, they need biological life alive for the sake of a scan. True. Oh, that makes sense, too. Yeah, there's just there was things throughout it where I was like, that's an interesting methodology or what they're doing is is calculated as well. Like it just shows that they have a plan. Yeah. As the Kalon take control of the bridge and the crew surrenders their stations, Isaac takes his familiar seat. Primary from the captain's chair orders the deployment of all forces with a course set for Earth. As the Orville departs, the spherical objects rise from the planet, revealing a vast armada to be continued. Man, very Star Wars-esque to me Mm -hmm. at the end here. It was, I I guess the rest of the stuff's my takeaway, so I'll just stop there. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like we're going to have a lot going into that part. So in that case, what is your takeaway from this episode? My takeaway is heartbroken about Isaac. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially when he takes his old chair. This is like a like a gut punch. And then how cinematic that ending was with the Orville going up and then all of these all these spherical ships start rising from the earth. Mm-hmm. 
And oh, it's just all very unnerving. I mean, the music was fantastic. Yeah. I thought the music at the end, it was very, I love me some Star Trek, but this whole ending of the episode gave me some very real Star Wars vibes, including the music. And I mean, the CGI was great in this episode. The character arcs were incredible, Mm -hmm. but also very soul crushing. I think that it's the whole to be continued. I can't like wait to see what happens, but I'm also like, oh no, nothing's going to be the same. Yeah. And the whole metaphor of you never quite know what something might be just by looking at it, including Isaac. And it goes so much deeper than just Isaac, but his whole race and... Essentially, we're about to find out if the whole bi- biological race is going to be wiped out. It's an episode that rewrites a lot of what we've watched already, which is crazy. Now that we're learning who Isaac actually is and what his purpose really was, it just frames everything so differently. Yeah, it makes you rethink the entire interactions Isaac has ever had with anybody. Mm-hmm. It's a hard way. It's a hard pill to swallow because he's a beloved member of the crew, but there's an awful, an awful uh, secret that's been lurking there for a very long time. Yeah. What did you think, Rob? Well, <laughs> before I give my opinion, one question. I know this mm-hmm. is part one of two, so it's hard to kind of gauge this as a complete story. Yes, there is a story here, even though we're left with it to be continued. But where would you put this in kind of the the rankings of prior episodes that we watched so far? This one's very exciting. I think it's very memorable. So for me... I don't love that Isaac is changing Mm. or he's never changed. We're learning about him more. I feel like it is. It's probably up there. I don't know that's top, but there's just something about this episode specifically Mm. that just you can't forget it. And I think that's part of why it's up there for me. Yeah, I agree. This is a really great episode. Mm -hmm. The balance between the comedy, the action and the drama here is exactly what I want from this show. We go from the mystery of Isaac being deactivated at the beginning to the humor that they, they they had little sprinkles of humor throughout, but it was largely within the farewell party. And it was all like very appropriate for the characters, the the levels of humor that they had in here. Mm -hmm. And then you go from that to the dramatic reveal of the skeletal graveyards to the action of the ship invasion. It's all really well executed. And there was a very nice balance in this episode that I thought worked very, very well. It's a good story. Mm-hmm. I want it all to be a dream. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Like you said, the visual effects in this episode are also stellar. Kalon itself looks amazing. And like I said before, I was blown away by the lighting when the Orville's first arriving yeah. on the planet and everything. Not to mention the Kalon head cannons. Wait, head cannons? Oh, head cannon. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> the performances are also great across the board. Uh, we haven't talked about Marcus and Ty all that much up to this point, mm-hmm. but they're both very impressive young actors and they really get to showcase it in this episode. Yeah, they've always been really good. When I was growing up and watching The Next Generation, like I felt like I had to like Wesley Crusher. Mm-hmm. But I could never really relate to him. Mm. And I feel like the kids in this episode do a really good job of being like relatable, actual children in having emotional responses. And it seems natural. It doesn't seem like they are acting. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they seem like they're integrated in this community and they are. I mean, I feel like Ty is really upset that. Isaac did that, and it feels like they have bonded over these episodes we've seen them in. Yeah, sometimes child performances can be distracting Mm -hmm. because they're just at a different level than people who have been acting for a lot longer. But like you said, they both feel very natural, so they're clearly talented. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what their background is, training and everything, but whatever it is, it's enough to be completely believable in these episodes. Mm hmm. I just feel a lot for the characters in this episode. Yeah, same. Same. There's a lot of emotional stuff going on. Yeah. And they're put in a very oppressed situation by the end. And it does what a to be continued episode does do. It makes it seem like there's no possible way out. They are just trapped. Yeah. This is our new life. Yes. <laughs> it's it's a hard pill to swallow that leaving this you feel unsettled. Yeah. Uh, because this is a to be continued episode, I will hang on to any big thematic takeaways. 
until we discuss part two and the story is fully revealed because then we can kind of talk about the whole thing as one cohesive story. Yeah. Before we get out of here, we have one more thing to do because Katie's husband, Mark, is a big fan of the Orville as well and always leaves us with his one sentence review. Isaac, what are you doing? Quantum Drive is a production of the Geek Generation. If you like this show, be sure to check out our other podcasts on the Geek Generation Network at thegeekgeneration.com. If you'd like to support the show and get access to exclusive bonus podcasts along with other perks, you can visit our Patreon campaign at thegeekgeneration.com slash support. You can follow Quantum Drive on Twitter at Quantum Drive Pod and me at the Rob Logan. You can follow me on Twitter at Play Katie Play and on Twitch at Katie Peters Plays. And Katie is spelled K-A-T-I-E. Please rate the show and write a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, we may read your review on an upcoming episode. Finally, questions and comments can be sent to quantumdrive at thegeekgeneration.com. We're out of here for now, but we'll see you soon in In the the future. future.